Today we will be discussing high-risk breast screening and management and lobular carcinoma in situ. I have no disclosures. Our learning objectives, we will be discussing high-risk screening for breast cancer, including high-risk assessment using risk calculators. We will discuss prophylactic options in high-risk patients to reduce risk for development of breast cancer, including hormonal prevention and prophylactic mastectomy, and we'll discuss the epidemiology, diagnosis, pathology, and management of lobular carcinoma in situ. We'll start with a brief case presentation. We have a 43-year-old Caucasian female who presents to breast clinic after screening mammogram findings of right breast mass and calcifications along with the left breast mass. She has no significant past medical history but has had uh, prior breast masses which were biopsied and found to be benign. She has a family history of a mother with pancreatic cancer and a maternal grandmother with breast cancer. She is a former smoker. She's had two children. She's premenopausal and she's never used hormone replacement therapy. In the, on physical exam, we find a small periareolar mass in the left breast. She has no skin changes or dimpling. She has no nipple discharge or retraction. And she has no abnormal adenopathy. On screening mammogram, she was found to have a mass and calcifications in the right breast, along with a mass in the left breast. On further workup with diagnostic mammogram and limited ultrasound, there were suspicious calcifications and a suspicious mass in the right breast, and there were bilateral benign appearing cysts. On corneal biopsy of the right breast, she was found to have lobular carcinoma in situ and atypical lobular hyperplasia in two sites. On MRI of the breast, she was found to have a circumscribed 7 millimeter mass in the right breast along with scattered benign cysts bilaterally. So let's take a minute to discuss high-risk breast screening and management. There are numerous risk models for breast cancer, including the Gale model, Tiger Cusick model, and BRCA Pro. The Gale model uses demographic and gynecologic features of the patient, along with prior history of breast biopsies or atypical hyperplasia. This cannot be used for patients with prior in situ carcinomas or chest radiation, but is often used to determine need for anti-estrogen therapies. The Tiger Cusick model considers similar risk factors and also takes into account risk for low penetrance disease carrier status. It is often used to determine need for MRI screening, but may overestimate risk in patients with LCIS or atypical hyperplasia. The BRCA Pro model takes into account a patient's family history of breast and ovarian cancer and predicts likelihood of pathologic BRCA1 or 2 gene mutations. It is important that when you're using a risk model or calculator to always review the specific population validation and the accuracy of the model that you're using. Indications for high-risk screening can be found in the NCCN guidelines. They are available for both identification and management of high-risk patients and there are specific screening rec recommendations based on specific risk factors. Several of the most common indications for screening MRI include history of pathologic gene variants, patients with a greater than 20% lifetime risk of breast cancer based on predictive models, a history of thoracic radiation therapy at age prior to 30 years, and a history of atypical hyperplasia or LCIS with a greater than 20% lifetime risk based on risk models. You can use screening ultrasound for high-risk indications in patients who are under, unable to undergo MRI and for patients with dense breast tissue that causes difficulty with screening mammography. So let's discuss risk-reducing hormonal prevention. This can be done with selective estrogen receptor modulators like tamoxifen or aromatase inhibitors like anastrozole. They're indicated for patients with atypical hyperplasia or LCIS and pr prior thoracic radiation therapy at age less than 30 years or a five-year breast cancer risk greater than 1.7 percent by the modified Gale model. It's important to note that tamoxifen has significant side effects including hot flashes, night sweats, weight gain, and bone pain. It can cause irregular menstrual cycles 
and also significantly increases the risk for venous thromboembolisms and endometrial cancer. The aromatase inhibitors are for use in postmenopausal women. They can be considered for use in patients with high risk for venous thromboembolism, and, but should definitely be avoided in patients at high risk for osteopenia or osteoporosis. It's important to perform baseline gynecologic assessment and bone density evaluation prior to the initiation of chemoprevention. In terms of risk-reducing mastectomy, it is typically routinely considered in patients with pathogenic gene variants. For example, in patients with BRCA1 or 2 mutations, the risk of breast cancer is reduced by greater than 90 to 95 percent, but there's insufficient data to determine the magnitude of risk reduction in other high-risk populations. Any discussion with a patient about bilateral risk-reducing mastectomy should be a shared decision with the patient. There should be routine consideration for carriers of pathologic gene variants. It's important to look at risk reduction models and NCCN guidelines to tailor the decision making to your patient. And finally, lifestyle modifications can be used to reduce risk for breast cancer. This includes decreasing alcohol use to less than one drink per day, exercise, including daily activity and avoidance of sedentary lifestyle, and weight control with a healthy body weight associated with risk reduction for breast cancer. Now let's talk specifically about lobular carcinoma in situ. This is a fairly rare pathologic finding in the breast, accounting for 0.5 to 2.3% of biopsies of breast lesions. It's typically found in premenopausal women with a mean age of 44 to 46. With classic LCIS, it will typically be asymptomatic. There may be microcalcification seen on mammography, but it is most often incidentally found on biopsy for other breast pathologies. Non-classic LCIS is more commonly mass forming and more commonly found to have calcifications on mammography, which can be in a similar pattern to DCIS. The histopathology of lobular carcinoma in situ includes multiple histologic subtypes. The classic subtype, as seen in the upper right-hand corner of the screen, includes small cells with small, round, uniform nuclei, eosinophilic cytoplasm with intracytoplasmic vacuoles, and will typically involve the terminal duct lobular units. The pleomorphic subtype is defined by marked nuclear pleomorphism, central necrosis and calcifications, as seen in the bottom right-hand corner, and can easily be mistaken for DCIS. The florid subtype, you'll see distension of the ducts and lobules, which can be mass forming, and central necrosis and calcifications as well. On immunohistochemistry, there will be a negative e cadherin stain, as with other lobular subtypes, along with cytoplasmic localization of P120. One important thing to note about LCIS is the risk for malignancy. While there is a low rate of upgrade to invasive malignancy on excisional biopsy for classic LCIS at less than 5%, there's greater than 20% risk with pleomorphic LCIS. In addition, it is a marker for high lifetime risk of invasive breast cancer. There is a greater than 7 to 11 fold lifetime risk for developing breast cancer in either breast and about a 1 to 2% per year lifelong absolute risk. The management of LCIS. With classic LCIS, you can undertake a non-operative management with a high-risk screening protocol. The patient has imaging pathologic concordance and no additional high-risk features. If these criteria are not met, surgical excision is indicated. With a non-classic LCIS, excisional biopsy is warranted in all cases. If the margins are positive for classic LCIS, typically no re-excision is necessary, but if they're positive for non-classic LCIS, re-excision should be considered, but there is insufficient data to determine the optimal negative margin width. Patients with LCIS should have high-risk screening with clinical breast exams every 6 to 12 months and annual screening mammograms. There should be a consideration for annual screening MRI if the risk is greater than 20%, based on risk models. 
Hormonal prevention is indicated in all patients and reduces the risk for ER positive breast cancer. And risk reducing mastectomy is no longer routinely performed due to the effectiveness of hormone therapies, but still, currently 5% of women undergo risk reducing mastectomies. Returning to our case presentation, after counseling of risks and benefits, our patient ultimately decided to undergo prophylactic bilateral mastectomies due to a history of multiple breast biopsies and the associated anxiety. She underwent bilateral skin sparing mastectomies and a right sentinel lymph node biopsy and tissue expanders replaced with a plan for oncoplastic reconstruction. Her final pathology showed lobular carcinoma in situ with associated atypical lobular hyperplasia, but no upgrade to an invasive malignancy.